Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it's great to be with you, and thank you uh, to you, uh, GCSB and uh, Meso and Atomic Reporters for uh, organizing this call today. Um, I will uh, give you an overview of uh, where things are standing with regards to the 2015 nuclear deal. Um, but uh, but let me first uh, start by by saying uh, but by making two categorical uh, comments. One is that. Um, I do believe that the JCPOA uh, is a gateway issue uh, in many ways um, uh, that would determine uh, whether there is a chance of de-escalation in the region, when, whether there is a chance of any kind of inclusive regional dialogue uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia and other neighbors in the, in the Gulf region or not. Uh, what would be the status of Iran-US uh, uh, strategic uh, rivalry? What would be the status of Iran-Israel uh, Cold War? A lot of that depends on the issue of JCPOA. And of course, when it gets to any prospect for constructive dialogue over non-proliferation issues as well with, uh, with the nuclear, um, with the NPT's uh, review conference coming up, uh, as well as any prospects for uh, discussions about weapons uh, of mass destruction, free zones uh, in the region or in the sub-region. All of this really depends uh, to a great extent on the fate of the JCPOA. Uh, second categorical comment is that we're really in a new world when it gets to uh, Iran's domestic politics, because this is the first time uh, that we have witnessed a, a total takeover of all levers of power by a single faction uh, in Iran since the late 1980s. Uh, the reality is we've seen periods where Iranian conservatives, hardliners have been uh, in control of all branches of government, uh, but we've never seen as much of uh, a homogenized, unified uh, control. Uh, every single uh, leader of, an inst of a major institution in Iran, be it the judiciary or uh, the, the government or uh, the foreign ministry or, or, or you name it, uh, is now someone who has a very close ties uh, to the Supreme Leader and to the Revolutionary Guards, or in other words, the deep state. Uh, this obviously has advantages and disadvantages that we can, we can discuss later on. Uh, but with these two comments aside, let me give you an update on the JCPOA. Uh, so as you know, we're currently in a phase of a diplomatic lull uh, that started in uh, June, on June 20th. Um, uh, this is uh, this was the sixth round of negotiations that created a package for U.S. and Iran uh, to return to uh, compliance with the JCPOA. There were still few uh, major disagreements that remained, uh, a, a few brackets in the text, uh, and the expectation was that the Iranians would come back to the table after consultations with the capital uh, in a matter of days or maybe a week or so. Uh, but uh, but two months later. Uh, they haven't returned, and we still don't have a good idea when they will return. Uh, and I, I would argue once they return to Vienna, uh, there are three possible scenarios. One uh, is that they would come and agree to a marginally better package compared to the one that was negotiated after six rounds of negotiations. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, would uh, potentially involve some additional sanctions relief, uh, but would not get into some of the most contentious issues. For instance, the Iranian demand that the U.S. provides a kind of guarantee uh, that would reinsure uh, international firms that the U.S. would no longer impose sanctions or withdraw or renege uh, from the agreement. Um, uh, I would say the chances of this scenario are about 25%. I don't rule it out because uh, the, the Iranians are facing with uh, a myriad of crises uh, today uh, from economic uh, issues, obviously, as a result of mismanagement and sanctions, but also to severe uh, environmental crises, uh, social crises, uh, and of course, the pandemic uh, that is still raging in Iran. Um, the other possibility uh, is uh, that they would uh, decide that the JCPOA is no longer serving their interest uh, and they uh, want to completely abandon it uh, and start from scratch. Um, there are a lot of uh, hardline conservatives in Iran who actually say what's the point of returning to a deal that didn't really serve our interest to begin with and is so unstable. Uh, the only thing that would uh, result from a return to JCPOA is that Iran would have to roll back its nuclear program and therefore give away its leverage uh, for economic incentives that are at best uncertain. Um, and, uh, uh, and so this is one area that uh, the, the ultra hardliners in Iran uh, agree to with a lot of people in Washington uh, that the JCPOA 
uh, is a fundamentally flawed deal and should completely be abandoned. I would give this scenario uh, a chance of about 15%, uh, because in my view, um, it is, uh, you know, Iran still uh, wants to test the waters and see if it can get a better deal or restoring the JCPOA, which remains the least costly option for, for, for both sides. Uh, but again, I can't rule it out. Uh, and finally, the likeliest scenario is I, I think uh, the Iranian negotiators will come to Vienna uh, and ask to renegotiate uh, the package that was negotiated after six rounds uh, in Vienna. Now, uh, the Iranians probably believe that because uh, the, their nuclear program has uh, grown sub, uh, substantially since, uh, since June, uh, and that uh, the U.S.'s leverage has peaked in the form of sanctions uh, that have reached a, the point of diminishing returns. Uh, the time is on Iran's side, uh, and therefore it will be able to extract more concessions uh, from the U.S. if it renegotiates from a position of strength. I think that's a miscalculation because I don't see a scenario in which uh, renegotiating this package would uh, move uh, U.S.'s core requirements and bottom lines. Um, so. Uh, this would probably result at some stage in scenario number two, which is a collapse of the JCPOA and, and uh, starting negotiations about an entirely new agreement, uh, but, uh, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, now, one final point, uh, there are pressures on this timeline. Um, uh, first one is actually coming in, in a matter of two weeks uh, with the IAEA's Board of Governors meeting. Uh, there are outstanding issues uh, with regards to uh, Iran's uh, safeguards commitments uh, with the agency. Uh, there are four sites that the IAEA has uh, questions about that the Iranians have not answered. Uh, and the Europeans uh, have been pushing uh, for transparency on this uh, to, uh, to, to no avail. Um, and uh, they've also tried to issue resolutions at the Board of Governors, but uh, refrained from doing so out of fear that it would derail uh, negotiations about the JCPOA. But this can't go on forever. My sense is that it's possible that we would see uh, some sort of uh, uh, at least hard and tough language uh, in the September board meeting. But if there is no progress by November, uh, I expect a resolution. Uh, and if we get into scenario number two or scenario number three, that the JCPOA, uh, it doesn't really, uh, uh, the prospect of its revival doesn't, doesn't look uh, promising. Uh, I would not rule out that Iran's nuclear dossier might once, once again be referred uh, to the Security Council. Uh, and this could result uh, one way or another, uh, depending on Iranian retaliation uh, in response as well, uh, to the collapse of the JCPOA. So we are in, in very tricky waters. Uh, and if uh, indeed we get back into any cycle of mutual escalation, uh, I think we can kiss goodbye the prospect of the Saudis or the Emiratis uh, uh, engaging with Iran in a way that it's, uh, it, it amounts to anything more than hedging their bets. Thank you. I stop here and look forward to comments from my colleagues.